Welcome to Spyberry. By spy fans, for spy fans. With Shane Whaley. Shane dives into the mystery and intrigue of spy books and movies. Both fact and fiction. Delivering reviews and interviews with authors, historians, intelligence experts, and spy fans. He discusses everything from John Le Carre, Len Dayton, Ian Fleming, Tom Clancy, Brad Thor, and many more. If you love spy books and movies, keep listening. This podcast is for you. This is Spyberry. It's a brush pass, quick and simple. You are listening to Brush Pass on Spyberry. Quick reviews sent in by spy fans for spy fans. Hello and welcome to episode 153 of the Spybury podcast. I hope you and your families are all doing well. Um, today, very quick brush pass for you. I realize I haven't recorded one of these in a while. And I wanted to share with you very quickly, because that's what a brush pass is, my, my feelings about a book, The Alpha List. This is a book written by Ted Albury, uh, published, I believe, in 1979. Let me just check. Um, yes, 1979 by Ted Albury. So let me set the scene for you. This book is about David Marsh. He uh, is working as a spy. He's a veteran intelligence agent, British. We find him at the start of the novel. He is in Berlin, and he's running a under the cover of a news service, a, a press service, if you will, and he is the British liaison officer with the West German police and with a division that is responsible for, um, I guess, keeping an eye on the underground movements. And that's what Marsh's background is, is breaking up these underground movements. And as the story progresses, he's asked to leave Berlin, uh, effectively leave his cover and almost be fired by the security services because the cabinet or some elements of the cabinet have a job for our protagonist. And the job is to basically put under surveillance a Labour member of parliament who, it's alleged, there, there is a source of information of which our protagonist doesn't know where it's come from, is alleging that he is a traitor. The MP is working for the KGB. So, uh, Touch of the Stone House, the John Stone House here. I'd have to check the years when that happened uh, to see, wonder if Ted got inspired by that. Um, but the, the the twist here is that this isn't your normal kind of, you know, spy watching a, a suspect novel. The protagonist, David Marsh, he knows the MP. They were boyhood friends, so they both grew up in Birmingham. So you have this story where he is keeping an eye on the member of parliament and his girlfriend and what he's up to. And he's also replaying their youth of how they grew up together um, in uh, what he describes as the back streets of Birmingham. And, you know, there, there's a passage, which I'll, I'll quickly read out for you. It's uh, when he's meeting one of his, um, one of the cabinet ministers. Uh, and, and again, as, as with most spy books, they're kind of all portrayed as buffoons and, uh, I mean, the, the mandarins as looking after each other. They, they fire him from the security services because they don't want anything getting back. They don't want it getting out that he, uh, a member of the British security services, is investigating an MP. And he, like any true blue Englishman, Parker left the business chat until we got to the coffee we moved over to the leather chairs, coffee in hand, and he made himself comfortable before he looked across at me. It must be fascinating what you're doing. In what way? He put down his coffee cup beside his chair. It's like a classic drama. You and Kelly, the two protagonists, the two boys who live next to one another, who grew up together, and yet you end up on the side of law and order, a senior security officer, but Kelly ends up as a traitor. What made it happen? Where was the parting of the ways? Fascinating. And again, here, basically, the establishment are, they've already, you know, 
hung drawn and quartered the MP there saying, yeah, we've got this intelligence, he's working with the Soviets. And Marsh's job is to find out if that's true and what on earth is going on. And Marsh is struggling to um, to accept that his old friend, that he's lost contact with, it's not like they're still friends, it's been a long time, and he's struggling to understand why Marsh is working for the Soviets. Um, th- there was another, um, another passage in here, I'll quick read for, for you, which I think tells us a little bit about Ted Albury himself. And he says, um, if you come back from the back, if you come from the back streets of Birmingham, it's all right to go back as a sergeant. But if you go back as a major, you don't fit in. And what I realized, uh, so I read the book, and then there's this wonderful interview on YouTube that um, is, is hosted by a chap called Webster. He's a very aggressive Scot. Did you kill anybody, Ted? With your bare hands, with a whiskey in your hand. It's a uh, terrible Scottish accent there. But fascinating, fascinating interview because Albury has this background. I mean, if there were, you know, you really wish there was a memoir that was written about uh, or by Albury or a biography about him because he had quite the life in counterintelligence. And it dawned on me watching this interview with Webster, um, much of what's in the Alpha List appears to be autobiographical. So I didn't know that Albury grew up in Birmingham. Uh, he, 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 there was a, there's a scene in the book which is classic espionage where he says that he, his interview for the intelligence corps was in the back street of a barber shop on Trafalgar Square. And you just think that's, yeah, straight out of a spy novel. That's where you'd expect it to be. Well, in this interview with Webster, Albury tells us that's actually what happened. That's how he got interviewed for the intelligence corps. He also shares some very funny anecdotes about the questions he was asked. And I was chatting with his daughter, Ted's daughter, Sally, who's a member of our Facebook group. And I said to her, I said, tell me about his schooling, because he said in the, uh, Albury said in the interview that he, he didn't have formal education, yet he spoke several languages. I think he was promoted up to lieutenant colonel in the British military. And she said, yeah, he taught himself German, Serbo Croat, and another a number of other languages, but he never went to university. Um, he has an interesting career after he got demobbed um, in advertising and, and, and various other things. And before he started writing books, I believe, in his mid-50s. Uh, and I want to cover Albury in more detail on future episodes. I'm not an expert. I'm just picking things up. But I bring this up now because so much of the alpha list seems autobiographical. Uh, of interest to Spybarians is the fact the book is actually dedicated to Len, Isabella, and the two boys. Uh, obviously referring to that, no, that's Len Dayton and uh, Mrs. Len Dayton. And he, yes, he does have two sons. And Len Dayton has been very, was very complimentary about Ted Albury's spy novel writing. So let me get back to the story. I just wanted to share that with you because I thought it was fascinating. But getting back to the story, you follow the surveillance, you follow the standard interview, the interrogation, those scenes are well written. And then there is, and I don't want to give too much away. There is suspense. There is tension. Is this MP a wrong one? Uh, what happens? And what I can share with you, and, and this is without giving away the ending. I've read two Albury books now, and I think it's fair to say they they all end quite tragically. And I was reading a, an interview um, with Albury, and apparently he, even though he was in the military, and in fact, his job was to break up underground movements, apparently, um, but after the war. And he, uh, you know, he's one of these people that served and says war is terrible, nobody profits, it's it's bad for both sides, and war is terribly tragic and sad. It shouldn't be glamorized. And as I say, this is the second Albury book I've read. And yeah, the ending, I was I was very sad at the end of it. So uh, that, that appeals to me. That's the kind of spy book that I enjoy. The other thing that appealed to me is, there's, there's no flashbangs, grenades, assassinations, explosions, you know, mass deaths, and very, very few deaths in this book. Very, very few. And that, that appeals to me. I want a gritty, realistic espionage drama when I'm reading my spy lit. I know some of you differ from that, and we've debated that till the cows come home on the Facebook group, and that's cool. But if you enjoy something that 
is gritty, realistic. I recommend the alpha list. I saw a few people on Goodreads pan it, which surprised me because I enjoyed it. And another reason why I enjoy Elbury's writing, he reminds me more of Brian Fremantle's books, uh, of his writing with a sprinkling of Dayton. I think he's definitely got the Dayton humor in there. Um, he's not a Lacare, And I say that in that there is only one Lacare, right? <laughs> Um, but what I love about Albury's books is they're gripping. The plot really reels you in. It was a page turner. And um, the cool thing about it is, let me see, 207 pages. So I was able to knock this one out in a weekend. Really good airport read, or if you've got a short flight, um, you, you'll get through it. It's, And I don't, I don't mean that in any way to denigrate the book in terms of its page size. But uh, I, you know, I, I flew through it, loved it, enjoyed it. I'm on this mission to find as many Albury books as I can out in the wild in hardcover, which is uh, not as easy as it sounds because I don't think he enjoyed the same success here in the United States that he enjoyed back at home. But I keep searching and it's fun. It's fun to go to these used bookstores and, and look for an Albury. But he was pretty prolific. He, he wrote, I think it was 40 books under his own name and a couple of pen names. So uh, I need to have a list on my phone. So I make sure I've already got a couple of duplicates here. Uh, and I did get my hands on a signed one. Uh, the other day. So so that was cool as well. One one last little thing I will share with you about Albury. Um, on the Facebook group, Sally was saying that the family has a, I believe, a first edition copy of the Ipcris file written by Len Dayton. And it's a uh, hand um, written note or inscription rather uh, to the original unnamed spy or to the real unnamed spy and something like that. I'll need, I'll need to search it out. So, you know, I asked myself, when did Len Dayton first meet Ted Albury? They were friends. Uh, although from what I've read, Albury wasn't the most gregarious or social of, of men. Um, they obviously met. And, and I see a lot of Samson, Bernard Samson in, in Ted Albury as well. Not, not just in terms of the look, um, but the way that he writes his humor, the way he observes and comments on his superiors. So I, I wonder if, the, you know, if, if uh, Len has really drawn on the Albury experience to come up with some of his characters. Anyway, this is meant to be a brush pass. Um, thank you for tuning in. I will link to the Webster interview. Uh, apparently he was Scottish, but he recorded these in British Columbia. He was a Canadian TV host. Uh, I, will say, I will add that to the show notes, which you can find at spybury.com forward slash 153. And if you are looking for chat with fellow spy fans, do come join us on the Facebook group. And even if you're not a Facebooker, just set up a random profile, join the group. The link's on the show notes. Have fun. There, there is so much learning. There's so much banter. There's so much humor with people like you and I who just love chatting about spy books, movies, and TV. Can you pull off a brush pass? Send in your review to shane at spybrary.com. Thanks for listening to the Spybrary Podcast. You don't have to wait for the next episode. Join the conversation happening now at facebook.com slash spybrary. And on Twitter at spybrary.